Hello and welcome back to the LIBF Banking and Finance podcast. This episode is a follow-on after show to a webinar run by our Centre for Governance, Risk and Regulation on key challenges that financial services firms are likely to face in the next few years after the initial consequences of the pandemic have settled in. They dive deeper into the topic and answer some of the questions that we didn't have time for during the session. If you'd like to watch the webinar, then click the link in our description, or if you'd like to register for our future events, go to libf.ac.uk forward slash events. Now time for the episode. Enjoy. Hello again, everybody. It's Olivier Beru here. I'm the founder of the um, Centre for Governance, Risk and Regulation at the London Institute of Banking and Finance. And today's podcast is an after show after our event that we've just held, uh, a webinar event that we've just held with our partners at the Risk Coalition. Um, so I'm going to hand over to our host for today, Natalie Kuhn, who uh, was uh, directing the conversation during the webinar, and she's going to help us to tackle some of the questions that we did, we did not have time uh, to cover during the webinar itself. Uh, together with me to answer um, Natalie's questions, we have Hanif Barna from uh, the Risk Coalition, who joins us, uh, the, the participants to, to the webinar, myself, Marcia, Cantor Grable and Brian Foss. So, uh, Natalie, over to you. Thank you, Olivier. Um, so there were there was quite a few very, very good questions during the, 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 the webinar that we actually didn't get around to. Uh, and the first one was, do you, should you use statistics um, and uh, to measure your risk and how, how well are they? And I have a view on that. My view is that statistics are really useful. They're a very good tool, but you have to be very careful how you use them. And the simpler, the better. Marcia. I uh, can only echo that. I think uh, boards have a responsibility to continue to ask whether the statistics they are seeing and how those statistics were derived and the source of them, whether they continue to address a problem, a question, a risk continuously. Um, and we've seen too many examples uh, where statistics are fed through to answer a question or preconceived notion uh, from either a regulator or board member but that may not get to the heart of the matter. So hopefully people keep that in perspective. It's like making your statistics meet your needs. Yes, the old quote, there's lies, damn lies and statistics. And now Brian, you do a lot of work with statistics. Um, uh, what's your view? Well, there's certainly a demand for data analysts at the moment. And typically, they don't go to university thinking I'm going to be a data analyst. They go there for maths or physics, and somebody stands in front of them, uh, weighs, some, weighs some money and a job in a nice office, and tracks them with a lot of technology and interesting things to do. But as board, we need to give them the direction that Marcia was talking about. So things are moving a lot faster, much, much faster. And we need to be watching to see those things moving so that we can take advantage or avoid issues. So watching what's happening means looking at data, but it also means filtering things out. Filtering things out, we need to highlight because there's so much data so we can focus on what's really important or summarize the data so that we get trends and so that we can see where, whether we're going in the right direction or the wrong direction. And as Marcia said, the board needs to have a very clear view of what it's asking for. Most board uh, agenda items are either for making a decision or for an update on that decision. And once the decision's made, we need to lay down what the measurement criteria is. And when it comes back over and over again, we need to be able to measure quite effectively against it. So we need that clear view. And of course, we take advice from others, uh, but that's how we underpin our accountability and particular the assurance or confidence that we've got that we're getting enough big steps in the right direction so that we know the commitments we've made to the stakeholders can be delivered on. Those, those are very interesting points. Um, Olivier, anything to add there? Thanks very much, Natalie. 
I think you, you, you cannot manage what you don't measure. And that's what Brian just said, you know, as a board or as a management team, you do need to have data points in order to be able to compare, ensure that things are going in the right direction, make sure that, you know, you're having an impact uh, and understand why, if possible. Um, so two things really to add. One is, you know, as a, as a board member, I find that I need statistics that come from outside the firm I am overseeing. So you know, I need to compare what they're telling me um, and interrogate the data and make sure that I understand how this data has been put together. Yes, absolutely. But I also need to be able to compare it to data that comes from somewhere else and contrast and compare with that. Because if I can't do that, then it's much more difficult for me to challenge uh, constructively and, and, and to bring a different perspective. Um, and then, you know, the, the other thing is, you know, interrogating the data takes a long, long time. Uh, it, mean, it means trust. It means you know, letting people explain to you exactly how they've done things, because if they want to obfuscate and not tell you, then, then they can, because you're short of time always on the board. And, and, and the issue is that, you know, the people who are putting together the statistics, uh, you know, by definition, have more time than you have. and They have more time to manipulate things. So you need to establish that, that level of trust and make sure, therefore, that, you know, so it goes back to a cultural issue. I think, you know, statistics are all about culture. <laughs> Funnily enough, it's not about math. It's about you know, sharing information and, and not being fearful that if the information shows you something you don't want to see, well, you, you can actually tackle this and, and you're big enough to say, actually, you know, this is showing us we're backing up the wrong tree and it's not your fault. You know, it, it, so a, not, not a blame culture, but a, a true investigative culture through statistics is what I think is, is important. But, you know, easy yes said than done. That's a very interesting point. I mean, you almost look for an, an independent outside statistics provider, but then you get a similar situations with the auditors because who pays the auditor, right? Hanif, uh, anything to add there? Hi, yeah, thanks, Natalie. That's, uh, I think, a really, really interesting question. And um, in, in my kind of day job as a governance consultant, I do a lot of work with boards looking at board effectiveness. And one area I focus on is around decision-making. And um, it's one area I've been thinking about, and I think there's two elements to it. One is really around evidence, which is where the statistics, if you like, come in. And the other is about judgment. And I guess my kind of take on it at the moment is sometimes those two pieces, they need to be completely joined up, but actually sometimes there's a gap. So I think the statistics provide a lot of the evidence base, but actually the question for me is actually are the boards asking the right questions about it? Are they asking what assumptions have been made? Are they, are they actually valid assumptions? Because otherwise you're gonna get the answers that you want. Um, if you've got models to produce an answer, are those models robust? How have they come up with the answers? Um, and essentially how reliable is, is all that? So I think my, my take on this is actually, the statistics are very important, but they need to be combined with good judgment and good challenge with, from board members with the right expertise. And, and I'm guessing the answer I hear, hear very often, but I like this number better, is not the right way to go. Absolutely. <laughs> um, now, it's interesting. I want to pick up on something that uh, Brian actually mentioned uh, about there's a big demand for data analysts. And, and I want to uh, broaden that out to actually looking at um, the, the whole reduction in learning and development budgets that we, we do see amongst some organizations. And I'm, I'm not saying they're all the same. And it's very often they say, well, we can't teach people enough because then they will leave. Or if we, if we teach them something, they want a higher salary. Um, and, and what is the impact on these things, on things like management capability, uh, the, uh, being open to fraud or vulnerability to fraud? Any, any views who would like to share some views with that, about that? I'm happy to have a first go, but I, I hopefully I'll inspire others to, to provide uh, better answers than mine. But as, um, as you know, as a, I, I, I am providing training as a, as a, as a, as a function of, of mine. So, so I, I am biased, I guess, but, um, if I look at the generation that follows um, me and, 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 and the even younger generation that comes in now, um, constant learning is, is, I think, at the heart of, of their life project. And th there is therefore a need for providing that environment to them um, as, a, as a sort of um, 
yeah, as a as natural habitat. Uh, I, I don't think anything else is going to enable you to retain talent for any length of time, whether or not you train people. You know, they will leave if you don't train them uh, much more, much faster, perhaps. And and also, you you won't even retain any that have been trained. So I think I think that's a completely losing strategy not to train your staff. Um, you know, to retain people who have been trained is always hard. That's true, but you often gain partners and potential clients and potential. Um, you know, suppliers that, you know, have been trained with you and by you and trust you and, and are thankful for the, the training you have provided. So I, actually, in the bigger picture, uh, and in the longer term, I think training pays uh, whether or not people stay. So I, I'd like to um, make a remark following on what you just said, Olivier. I believe that um, the learning and development and the investment made in people, whether they stay, and I'll come back to that, but whether they leave is a great investment. There's nothing better than spreading your advertising, your value by developing a cadre of people who have been known to be trained at X and they become, if you will, um, certainly hot property or in pursuit in the marketplace. And actually, many of those people then start to realize the value of the camaraderie, the support, the development they got at that organization. What I'd like to see more of then is more people then returning. And I think we still have this mentality out there that, um, you know, once gone, that's it, you go and, and you go away. There are organizations where you can come back and, and reinvent yourself and reposition yourself. So I think it's money very well spent. And it is a travesty, frankly, if it's not um, spent. And it has to be certainly very targeted because it is a way to reinforce culture it's a way to build teams, and this is going to be vital as we go into a hybrid world, just vital. Okay, maybe, maybe I can jump in here as well, because I also do quite a bit of work in helping others to develop themselves. And one of the things I think a lot about is why, why we're doing that. And of course, you get some self-development and personal satisfaction, but as financial services professionals, most of us are members of chartered bodies. Now, it's too easy to forget, but when those bodies put forward their application for charter, they committed to put public interest before personal interest, before member interest. So in our profession, we are there to work for the public interest, and we develop our skills as members in order to be better at delivering that. So that's something that's very often overlooked. If the bodies we're members of, are there for the public, not for us. Now, of course, I'm on a number of boards and boards in the past have almost thought they're beyond CPD, they're beyond development. And that's not true. And the PRA has told them very clearly that they should not think that way. And now we're seeing regular board assessments. It's making it very clear to them where they need to develop their skills. And so with the pressure of the regulator and the other stakeholders, boards are starting to step up to continual personal development and even to a completely different uh, approach to inclusion and diversity on boards. But those people need that development. And where are they going to get it from? Again, it's very unique to them. And one of the things that I'm focused on at the moment, uh, in addition to helping some board courses, is to provide one-on-one -on -one mentoring for those execs who take their first non-exec role somewhere else. And I know it's an additional time spent on something new and outside a very busy exec day, but it completely changes your understanding of what boards do, what your role is, why, be, why you're being asked to do something, what good looks like, what your purpose and outcome is. And it lifts you into a new level of capability in terms of delivering on that public interest uh, in all regards. And I'd say one thing we all need to think about as to what we should do for ourselves is a, a message that came to me from when I was an exec. Um, when I started out, we used to promote people 
that had potential. And that was great because we were given opportunities. Then it moved on and people were promoted when they were ready. Today, you have to already be doing the job before you're promoted into it. So make sure you are. And the way to do that is to take control of your personal development plan. Go out and find those courses, find those unique personal development opportunities. Uh, get support from your boss or bosses, but own and drive your personal development plan yourself so you become that person that's ready for promotion. Thank you very much, Brian. That was great. Um, I, I think another aspect of, of what you said, and you mentioned it, Brian, is the um, you know the diversity. And it, it's much easier to see whether you don't know something if your board is diverse enough, because people will look at you and, and, and say, you know, didn't you know that? You know, and suddenly you think, oh, um, no, I didn't. And, and you know, your perspective, your the, the other person's um, skill set, experience, etc., clearly prepares them better for this particular topic than, it, than, than you are prepared. And suddenly you realize that not only is it good to have diversity because you can cope with more issues, but also it, it, it clearly lays out the, the gaps that you know exist in, in some board members that may have been there for a bit too long and uh, have not invested enough in personal development. Exactly. Sorry. Sorry, Natalie. It's, it's beneficial for everybody, right? I mean, um, and, and the, the thing that I hear uh, from what you guys are saying is, yes, you should be doing this because it will. Uh, yes, people will leave. I mean, because they do. Um, but it, it builds a sort of brand loyalty. And then what you will see, and I've, I've seen that happen, uh, is that that becomes the place that everybody wants to work because it is the one that will give you something to learn. Even if you leave after that, it will build some loyalty to that farm. One of the things uh, this discussion reminds me of, Natalie, is um, my favorite Dilbert cartoon. And this is where Dilbert is saying to his boss, um, don't we spend any money training people and developing them? Um, and his question to the boss is, how do we recognize our best people? And the boss turns around to Dilbert and says, we recognize them because they're the ones who leave our organization. Um, and um, that's, that's kind of my, my all time favorite cartoon. But I think it's, it's, it, it kind of has an underlying message in there, which is really important. And I think the discussion we've just had around uh, risk and the speed of change just tells me we can't afford to sit around and do things the way we used to do five, 10 years ago. So that speed of change, the changing environment, uh, you know, all the stuff we're talking about today around ESG and uh, technology and digital, uh, 10, 15 years ago, they weren't even on the agenda. So I think there's that constant need to refresh. And I guess the challenge for me is, one is uh, actually be thinking more broadly about that uh, development um it's not just about going on courses it's uh, different ways of doing it brian men mentioned mentoring uh one of my clients i've been working with they've got a uh in a really important function they've got a really good number two but the problem is that individual has not worked anywhere else apart from an accounting firm and that role so how do you get broad experience so it needs a bit more i think creative and innovative thinking about how to develop people to get the most of, uh, of, of what they do. And I, I think the other part is actually reminding people that uh, the training doesn't stop when you get to the board. Actually, that's almost more important because that's when you need that breadth of experience and breadth of knowledge to bring to, bring to, uh, bring to what you're actually doing. So um, I, think, I think those for me are the key points is think broadly about development and also uh, make sure uh, it never stops. Um, yeah, so I, I think this is a really important area and probably more important today than perhaps in recent times. And I, I think it's, again, this kind of changing environment we, we saw at the early part of the pandemic, uh, obviously that switch to remote working, working from home, creating new risks um, and potentially new vulnerabilities. And that kind of creates uh, a big, big area to look at. Um, in the discussion we had, Olivia, you mentioned, for example, the question about all the loans that have been made um have they have, have are, are they actually going to be recoverable uh, i suspect we're going to see issues around that coming in as well so i, I think this is an area i feel with uh, a lot of organizations uh the, the 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 management team the board really need to be focused on some of the risks and again it kind of probably needs a little bit more uh kind of breadth of thinking 
there may be new ways that uh, some of these players might be attacking an organization to to understand what's going on. And I think the bit that worries me as well sometimes in the current environment is with all the remote working, a lot of trust building comes from the face to face contact uh, with colleagues and uh, customers and so on. If you're not able to do that, you're doing it online. Are you actually going to be able to work out uh, you know, where some of the vulnerabilities are going to be? So um, I, I, I certainly would completely agree, a really important area and probably becoming more important as we emerge from, from the pandemic. You, ma you make a very interesting point there about trust and not being, you know, and, and face to face nature of, of trust. And one of the things that um, I keep on, I mean, I, I'm just waiting for the um, for the, the data to come out is how many of the loans that have made during the pandemic uh, or by fintech companies where right? there's no face to face contact are fraudulent in comparison with how many we had before that time. <laughs> Now, one of the things that we're saying is um, the vast majority of fraud goes through banks. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, Brian, would you, what would you say? So, uh, well, the FCA is taking a particular interest right now in vulnerable customers and has updated the trading customers fairly regime quite substantially in the responsibilities it's reminded banks of. And in parallel to that, it's expected banks to improve the culture internally to be more customer focused and to speak out when things are out of line so that we don't fall into this group thing uh, of not making changes which are beneficial. But instead of that, we're more innovative, more responsive, and uh, put things in place which are actually beneficial to the customer. So I think there are a number of things that can be done. One of them is recognizing vulnerable customers. Another is giving them the tools, because as you said, it's not necessarily the bank's responsibility. Um, and the bank is only part of an ecosystem with others. So uh, car dealers, solicitors, many others are required to follow the same anti-money laundering techniques. But my focus here would be to suggest that if uh, vulnerable customers are often misused uh, to um, and lose out from fraud, then those are the ones we should be identifying and supporting. So we shouldn't just see it as a negative for banks, we should see it as a negative for our customers, and we should help them with the tools and technology to have a better life. One of the questions from the chat that I don't think we've addressed yet is from a participant who says, what keeps me awake at night is the regulator's expectations for banks to be first in line of defense for anti-money laundering, whilst, in fact, according to the participant, anti- or money laundering problems actually reside outside of banking, for example, in the arts, cryptocurrencies and real estate, to give examples um, about wh where that is a problem. Masha, would you, would you have a view on that? I, I have a lot of sympathy for that, that question. Um, it, it is true. I mean, if you look at, there was a study done by UK Finance um, that came out sometime in 2021. I think it had almost 1.3 billion pounds of fraud that occurred in the last year, so 2020 during the pandemic. And that was by a variety of different means, uh, uh, people using cards or push payments or checks. But, um, and, and those, that's, that's the big headline, right? Uh, and so it's an easy target uh, to, to actually push on the banks to make sure they, it's not just know your customer, it's now gone to know your transaction. So know your transaction will require the characterization of the transaction or the payment uh, to be standardized. And for all of you um, on this podcast, you will know that when you authorize transfers via the means you use, you will sometimes get questions of why this is being done and you may get some questions, one of which might be, one option might be miscellaneous. 
I'm not sure what you can learn from miscellaneous or maintenance or expenses. So it's not standardized. So it's ve very challenging to sort out how you know your transaction. Um, so I, I can understand there's a lot of focus from the regulator to stop AML going through the systems. And let's be also clear, a lot of banks have not uh, handled themselves well in the past. There are legions of stories of things that have been done to deliberately go around AML and sanctions, et cetera. Um, that said, the question related not just to banks, but also mentioning real estate, and there was one, oh, crypto as well, both of which are true. Um, it's just you know, amazing the amount of, of fraud on, on that. And you wonder why uh, real estate advisors and mortgage brokers are not catching some of these things. Uh, they do, but some of it continues to happen. And crypto is in fact um, anonymous. So it is a perfect storm and a perfect way to enable money laundering and criminality. And that's been some of the issue with cryptocurrencies. That said, I don't think this is the end of, of crypto. There, there'll be a, a, place and a place for them. And we have yet to see how that story totally unfolds. But for right now, they are an enabler of money laundering. Uh, absolutely, I, I do agree with that. Um... And one of the things that I've uh, noticed is that um, is, is that the, the the number of issues with crypto then result in people saying, "But I still want my money back," and are then surprised that they can't get their money back, um, except for when it was actually bought with a credit card. Um, my personal view on this is that the more banks stop money laundering, the more somebody will go and look at something else. And therefore, that last bit is, is possibly not really a realistic expectation for banks to catch out. So what I would like to do is thank you all for your contributions. It was a very, very interesting discussion. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank all the audience for listening to us and staying with us through this. And please do come back for the next uh, event. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to find out more about our qualifications, training and upcoming events, then go to libf.ac.uk. We also have other podcast channels that dive into topics like trade finance, financial advice, fintech and more. You can find all of them at libf.ac.uk forward slash podcasts.